that i'll go to the next question do you think gary's demise has left a void in the movement why don't we see world federalist rallies and demonstrations featuring the headlines anymore we don't find people uh, interrupting un meetings and standing up for the cause of the world like it's very peaceful right now we don't find that level of activism right now what do you think yeah well i mean obviously there's the pandemic which has <laughs> kept us all inside that that would be maybe the current the current reason for lack of maybe the kind of outright activism that we we saw even just a few years ago maybe not to the degree of gary but gary as i mentioned he was an actor a comedian he it was so clever that he could take an idea uh, about how to raise awareness he would put out a press release so people would know what he was doing and then you know the next day do that action whatever it is whether it was camping out on the steps of the of the UN in Paris when it was declared international territory whether it was you know living on the on the uh, uh, at the border between France and Germany or what he you know he tells different stories like for example in a world citizen in the holy land he talks about how he camped out on the middle of the bridge between Israel and Jordan and how the officials were yelling Davis get off the bridge and in in Gary who was sitting there in the middle but in the no one's land you know on the line between the two countries in the middle of the bridge he's like why do I need to get off the bridge i'm not in your country i'm not in that country i'm on the line and they would yell back well because we we shoot at each other at night and Gary's like what you shoot at each other at night this is ridiculous so they actually had to physically pick him up and carry him off the middle of the bridge and back into the country really illegally because he he was supposed to have left the country which he did when he was on the the middle of the line between the two and of course he would always tell the press the press would show up and the press would make the national government officials sort of embarrassed or you know either embarrassed or maybe angry because then then there was other people to witness what was going on so getting witnesses to your action of course and now with you know your a mobile phone you can do that very well on social media is is do an action like that Uh, you know that's not harming anybody you're just sitting on a on a borderline for example but to show that that borderline is ridiculous so there really is no border the only borders are maybe up in here in our in our head and maybe some in here in our heart that we that we can easily remove uh with with love and knowledge right um and there's another book uh that Gary wrote called Passport to Freedom a guide uh, for world citizens which is a uh, chock full of stories that talk about some of these actions that Gary took uh that to that to take them today would be harder because like for example Gary was a pilot and he was a pilot even later on in his in his adult life he had he had a plane called well, World Government 1 so World Government Air Air Force you might say uh and um he would sometimes because he had a helmet you know a, 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 an aviator or, or a pilot helmet he would sometimes go in the line with the pilots and get on a plane even though he wasn't flying that plane because people in the airport wouldn't know to do something like that now is a lot harder because of the uh identification documents that you have to show even to get into the airport or to get into to that area of the airport so to do something like he did is so much harder because of the the strong amount of policing effort you know that is that is at least you know appears uh when we are flying or taking any kind of travel so to do that kind of thing might be difficult but one of the things that we thought about doing uh which we haven't done yet but would be to get a group of maybe 3 or 400 people um and go to a frontier a border a borderline or so called borderline and then go across the border all together with our world passport to make a point like for example a whole bunch of of people in the United States going into Mexico you know and then coming back with just the world passport and say look you know and if you get a whole large group of people you might be able to do it in fact i remember I'm trying to remember now there was a, a CNN this was just frontiers like through in eastern europe and all or through greece and all that they just the the national immigration officers just couldn't stop them there were just too many people um to to stop them so i mean we have the power of our minds to to conduct these kind of uh uh you might call them uh um uh progress i mean there's a a a a peace uh educator named Jean Sharp who uh has a list of um 198 actions that we can take for peace well there's a lot more than that there's probably four or 500 actions at least that we can take for peace 
but this this is a good way to to look at well what can we do with you know uh, whether it's just a sit-in you know or whether it's a, a march in the streets or whether it's putting a banner in a window or you know something as simple as that or whether it's posting on your you know on a daily basis on your Twitter feed or something about human rights or whatever it might be. There's a lot of little actions that can really be important and that could sort of put a dent in the nation state armor, uh, so to speak, to, to help us to begin to, to remove that, that facade. It's really just a facade. And that's so the way anyway, the, 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 the final thought though, actually, is um, so we don't necessarily have the, that Gary Davis now. We need to find people who are willing to be the Gary Davis, willing to be the, the Socratic gadfly, you might say, to challenge this system. Uh, and there are people who do it. There are groups like uh, Code Pink that will go to events and you know go up to the speaker's podium, even though they're not a speaker on, on the agenda, and start talking. I mean, they, they're really good at that. It was so, similar to what Gary would do. So there are groups that, that do that. There are groups that provide witness to, to war and to violence and other things and show those you know, to, to raise awareness. So there's a lot of things that we can, can do. Um, it's certainly harder now during the pandemic, but, but I'm, I'm sure once things uh, improve health-wise for, for people, at least maybe not the planet yet, but for people, uh, we can make a change, definitely. I find that to be very- Power in our hands. Say, say it again, Omkar, sorry. Yeah, I find that to be very cool and uh, I personally would like to live a life like Gary, like completely inconsiderate towards national narrow uh, borders and stuff. And he's like very courageously going forward and putting forward his own opinion and reaching out to the people directly. That's a really cool thing. And I draw inspiration from him for that reason, because we've had a lot of people who are uh, maybe very uh, deep into publishing articles and academic essays but then at a point of time you really need somebody to take forward the trouble of carrying out an activism activist's role and Gary was the person whom I found so that's a really inspirational story yeah well so the world federalist movement the world citizen movement we need we do need a new Gary uh, I agree or, or you know it doesn't have to be Gary uh but anyone anyone can anyone could do this uh it, it's sort of I think for Gary um, at at the, that point in his life, you know, it was almost like he had nothing left to lose. In a sense, he had lost his brother. He had lost his, he felt maybe his heart for the killing that he had done. He, he had to make amends. And, and so, you know, when, when you can be what he would call a renunciate, when you can renounce, you know, anything else other than just that action in that moment to protect somebody or to save somebody's life or to shed light on some injustice. You know, that's why, you know, a lot of people who have vested interests in, in, in their day-to-day -day life and what they're doing, it's so much harder uh, to, to take that kind of action. I mean, Gary was, Gary was in prison two more times than Martin Luther King. He was in prison 34 times in his life simply for uh, being a world citizen, for uh, claiming that status and not always uh, either, like I said, sometimes sneaking into countries on his own, you know, in the middle of the night or, or either that or because they didn't want to accept his document, even though it's valid and legal. I mean, Gary says, you know, in, in his memoir, My Country is the World, I would gladly give up my freedom today if it meant that humanity would begin to understand what it means to, to, to have one world and to have peace and law for the world. As a lawyer, do you think the International Court of Justice has served its purpose? And what reforms would you suggest? Well, so the International Court of Justice is only for nation states to prosecute cases against other nation states. And even when they do that, even if a nation state has agreed to a compulsory jurisdiction in that court, if they're a powerful nation state, they can still ignore the ruling. <laughs> and that has happened, uh, where governments will just trample upon other governments uh, and other sovereignty, so-called sovereignty of other governments, because they can do it, not because they're, they're, they've been, you know, told that they could, but just because they decided to do that and have the power to, because they've got the tanks and the bombs and the army or whatever, so they can do what they want. So I don't think the ICJ, you know, is, is enough. In fact, this is why we need a World Court of Human Rights, so that individuals uh, who don't have access to the uh, ICJ, although Gary did, uh, which he talks about in this book, Gary did go to, uh, Gary Davis goes to court, he talked about going, going to the International Court of Justice as if he were a nation state himself. 
Uh, but it's not for individuals. And even the International Criminal Court, although it's for individuals, uh, you know, has, has such a limited, really, uh, focus on war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes against the peace, which all relate to violence or war, pretty much. Yeah, they're, they're trying to expand it, uh, uh, like their responsibility to protect and other things like civilians. But that still doesn't deal with human rights violations or environmental rights violations. That's why the, the ICJ is not enough. It's Calling it a world court, which is the other name for the International Court of Justice, is, is a misnomer. It really is not. Uh, we need a, a court of, by, and for the people of the world. Do you think it's possible to be a patriot and a world citizen at the same time? Of course, Gary would always say, in fact, even, even in our world citizen credo and pledge, it says that uh, maintaining your, your loyalty to your local community or population is, is not a problem as long as you don't pick up arms or guns or something because of that. So there's nothing wrong to love, to love your locality or your community, it's, uh, but it's important to add that extra layer of com comprehension and loyalty to humanity and the earth. I, what I like to say is why fight and die for a country when you can love and live for humanity and the earth. Uh, so we need to have that, that human and earth mindset. Uh, if we can start having that mindset, then, then we'll, we can have so, such a, you know, a so much better world. That's a really nice thought. So like, is it a quote of your own making or you have taken it from a book? No, I, as far as I'm aware, unless I, I don't think I heard that anywhere. I, I, I always wanted to, whenever the media would reach out to me, I wanted to have a soundbite, you know, something that I could say that would hopefully be quoted uh, and that's a short enough, but gets the point across. So as far as I'm aware, I, I, I'm the one who said, you know, why fight and die for a country when you can love and live for humanity and the earth? I mean, it's, it's really to say that, look, um, because this gets back to your question, if, if we don't have a humanity, if we continue to fight each other, if we have a nuclear war or, um, or if we cannot deal with how we're handling the environment so unsuccessfully, if humanity dies, we die with it. You know, if the earth dies, we die with it. So we are thinking about our governing at the wrong level. Uh, the, the local level is not enough. You can be a patriot, but you also have to be a world patriot. Uh, uh, and that's, that's what being a world citizen is about. We're not, in fact, when we register people as a world citizen, when we issue the world passport or other documents that we issue, you do not give up any other allegiance that you have or, you know, status. You're just adding that additional status of having rights and duties to humanity and to the earth. How do you think an equilibrium of power will be achieved in a world federation? Considering the evidence of evident belligerence of nations currently, like US cannot go on with China and India cannot go on with Pakistan. So in this situation, even if we have a world federation, do you think there will be an equilibrium of power? Well, I mean, not in, not in the current system, no. I mean, the current system of sovereign states that can wage war as a final resolution to conflict, that's not law, that's, you know, international, international law is not really law, it's an oxymoron. You can't have law unless there's a common world law beyond it. So uh, there is a group of people who are working and we're working with them to promote a, a constitution for the Federation of the Earth. In fact, there's a lot of people in India who are really excited about this Earth constitution, and I, I am too. Uh, and that actually outlines, and they're a World Federalist organization too, that outlines a whole way that we can come together beyond our, our current distribution or categorization of you know who we are you know as Chinese or Ghanaian or uh, Guatemalan or whatever other term that someone might put on us or that we might choose to put on ourselves uh, that talks about uh, organizing the world in a legal way with a world parliament or world legislature with a world court system and they even have a they even have a world legislative act uh, number 15, I think, which supports the World Court of Human Rights that World Service Authority has, has drafted the statute for. Um, so I don't see in the current system that functioning, but it doesn't mean we get rid of completely the current system. I mean, just like here in the United States, you have different states that have some power, right, to do certain things. But then there's still that common federal law that prevents certain things from happening. So you don't have an insurrection. So you don't have violence. So the people will 
even if they don't like something uh, that's going on, they can, instead of fighting over it with guns, they take it to court. And you might say, at least in the, in the, in the common law system, it is like a fight in a court you know, who wins and who loses, so to speak, but it's done legally. It's done through uh, adjudication, not through, you know, brute force. It's the force of law, not the law of force, as people say. Suppose a world federation is achieved. What role do you think your organization will play there? Well, I mean, I think in a sense, what we're doing is leading as a world citizen government or a world citizen government, you might say in microcosm, that is doing some aspects of what a world got fully functioning world government would do is leading into that. So I could see a role, you know, especially like with our World Court of Human Rights as, as being part of a, a world judicial system that that would still continue and that uh, people who've worked with World Service Authority and new people who've come in, come into uh, working with us over the next few years could be, in a sense, the, the uh, some of the leaders within this new system. Um, who have already uh, the mindset of world citizenship or of world federation. So I think it's really by building this community of world federalists and world citizens, we're actually developing the, uh, the statecraft or the world statecraft, you might say, or the world uh, democratic world government um, functionaries, the people who, who could be functioning in that government that once it fully takes effect in the future. So I, I see it as a, just really as, as a flowing stream from here to there, in, in, a, in a sense. What are your opinions on having a language like Esperanto or Globasa as the official language of the world, instead of the current even official languages? Sure. Well, first I'll say saluton, that means hello, <laughs> in Esperanto. <laughs> um, and Esperanto actually almost became an official language, I think through the League of Nations and then maybe the UN, but, but the, the one contingent, uh, which was the French contingent decided that no, the French language is the diplomatic language. We can't have Esperanto. So it, unfortunately it did not, it did not succeed. Uh, but there are still a couple million people around the world who speak Esperanto when they, especially people in technology in like the computer and IT fields who, when, you know, you're going, when there's people who might mostly speak English go to a uh, you know, country, say in Asia, like China or something where there's no at all common, even alphabet, right. Um, where they might um, speak in Esperanto uh, and, and at, at their conferences, but there's Esperanto music, there's Esperanto poetry. Um, and so, you know, there's a big, even online community of Esperantists and, and I, even the, the world passport, uh, you can see has um, Esperanto on it. It's one of the seven languages, English, French, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, Arabic, and Esperanto are, are, are on the world passport. So we certainly support that idea. Um, and, you know, and it's sort of a shame that English has become uh, the de facto world language in many respects. But yeah, coming, coming together, I mean, even with technology, here's where we talk about technology, whether it's blockchain technology or artificial intelligence technology. I don't know if you also remember from Star Trek where they had, I don't know if it was something on their ear, or I guess like a little court, uh, I don't know what they call it, a tricorder in their hand, which could immediately translate what someone was saying. I mean, we have that now almost with Google Translate and other translation tools. You almost don't need, you know, a human translating. The computers can do a pretty good job of it now so that you could still speak the language and, and appreciate your own language. Well, let me put it this way. We don't want to get rid of the, you know, thousands actually of world languages that exist. Those are beautiful. That's what makes being human so fun, interesting, and rewarding is that people have different cultures, different um, languages, different religions, different foods that they eat or whatever, or pre preparation of foods. Uh, so that's what makes being human kind of interesting, fun, educational. We don't ever want to get rid of that. We want to protect that. But the only way to protect those, you might say, other um, or lower level, if you want to put it that way, uh, identities is to, to raise your awareness to that higher level and protect everything below. So is Esperanto easy to learn? Um, it's relatively easy. I was taking, uh, Center for Global Solutions actually had a class I didn't get to go to all of them, but they did have a class, I think, I don't know, 10 or 15 sessions uh, to learn Esperanto, but it only has 16 rules, which are never violated, uh, and, which is amazing because like English has a lot of rules. I don't know how many, but they're always violated. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense. Like a GH might sound like an F, you know, like the word tough, you know, or rough. Why is GH? Why is it spelled GH? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So someone learning it, coming into English and learning that from another language might say rug or tug or something, you know, not knowing that, that the GH makes an F sound. 
Uh, yeah, it's it's a, you know it'd be nice to have a language that is very easy like Esperanto. It's interesting. I didn't know that it's also used in the field of technology. Like I used to think that after it was made, maybe a lot of people supported the idea, but it's not very actively used. But it's interesting to know that it was almost accepted and people use it in the field of technology. And of course, a lot of world federalists they are strong enthusiasts of the language. I believe the Citizens for Global Solutions had a workshop where they taught Esperanto and that's yes. interesting. In fact, this book, World Federation uh, uh, by Ron Glossop, he has been on the board of, of Citizens for Global Solutions and a world federalist. He's, he was almost 90 and he's been doing it for at least 50 years or so, or 60 years. Uh, he is an expert in Esperanto actually. Uh, and I'll, but he also wrote this book. He was a philosophy professor. He wrote, he wrote this book. He also wrote a book about um, um, what's it called? I uh, can't remember the, the, the title, but something of like uh, dealing with war, confronting war, confronting war. I think it was called. Uh, so you know, there's a, even some really strong world federalists who who love the idea of, of using Esperanto as a way to to bring people together. And. Uh... When the movement started initially, uh, the World Federalist Movement, uh, I believe it was stronger towards the Western Hemisphere, like in places like the, the United States and maybe parts of Europe and so on. Currently, what's the situation in the United States? Like, how are people receiving the idea and how positive sure. are people's uh, opinions on a world government or on being a world citizen as a whole? Well, there is was an article that one of the... Uh board members of Citizens for Global Solutions, uh, also a former professor named Larry Whitner, wrote about, he did research about how there's still many people, maybe it's 56% or even all close to 60% of the population who thinks that, that, that we should have like a stronger United Nations. We should, could even, should or should even have some kind of world parliament or people's parliament. So there's a lot of support even here in the United States, which, you, which you'd sort of be surprised. And it's not just support from the liberal left or, you know, but there's also support from even the conservative right uh, for this idea. Uh, in fact, for most of the history of the World Federalist Association and Citizens for Global Solutions, it was, it was a bipartisan or nonpartisan really organization. But there was a, even the, the president of the, um, of the World Federalist Association at, at one point was a former Republican senator, actually, who actually ran for president. Uh, uh, I think he ran as an independent though. But in any case, it, it, you know, the idea of World Federation transcends politics, really, not world politics, but it transcends national politics. It transcends the div divisiveness of national politics because you, you, know, you should be able to ask uh, any politician like, do you want to have a world tomorrow? And you, I would think most sane politicians would say, yes, I do. But you know, the question is what kind of world? Which brings me to an, another quick funny story. Um, Gary Davis, well, he ran for mayor of Washington, DC, but he also ran for, he also ran for president of the United States on the World Citizen Party ticket. But, but this, there's this one story Gary told me once about how he was invited to debates with the, the two DC mayors. There was a Marion Barry and Carol Schwartz. Marion Barry was always the Democratic contender and, and Carol Schwartz was the Republican contender uh, for mayor. They always were competing with each other like for many years in a row. Usually Marion Barry, well, I don't think Carol Schwartz ever won, but Marion Barry always won. But Gary was get, got to be on the podium with them. And when he got up there as a World Citizen Party uh, politician, uh, he's like, well, you know, isn't Washington D.C. a world city? And and he, he look at you know Marion Barry and Carol Schwartz and like yeah, uh, you know they both agree with him. And he's like, well, you know, and this was during like the 1980s. Uh, you know, isn't it bad that that you know we have bombs that are that are directed towards Russia or the Soviet Union, and Soviet Union has bombs directed towards us? You know, we're a world city. Washington D.C. might be one of the first cities that gets bombed right in a nuclear war. And they're like, you're right. I agree with Mr. Davis. So it was funny to see how, you know, they couldn't argue against anything he said because it was transcending that division that they represented. What are your plans for your organization in the upcoming years? Sure. Well, I mean, the long-term goal, obviously, is to have a fully functioning, democratic, participatory, world federal government of world citizens. <laughs> That's obviously the ultimate goal, right? But how do we get, you know, from that, you know, might say it's a utopian dream, although I don't think it is. I mean, I, what I like to say, and get me back on point if I forget, um, 
if you told somebody in 1900 that in 69 years, humans would land someone on the moon, that, they would say, they would laugh at that. They would say, that's ridiculous. How could, how could we put someone on the moon? You're, you're, you're silly, you know, that's wrong. That's never gonna happen. And in fact, it was still four years before the, the plane took off, the Wright brothers plane took off in Kitty Hawk, right? Where, where humans could actually make a mechanism that would allow them to fly. So to think in just 69 years though, that we could land humans on the moon, right? And soon maybe with, uh, uh, you know, other SpaceX and other organizations, Blue Origin, maybe we'll be landing somebody on Mars soon, right? Um, if we can do that within as little as 69 years, why can't we have a world government? Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in five years, but maybe in 10 years, maybe in 25 years, why not? And of course, the, you know, what is it Robert Kennedy said, um, some people uh, look at the world and see the problems and ask why. I look at the world and see what we could do and say, why not? So I agree with that. I, I see a world that has a lot of possibility, a lot of opportunity, um, a lot of sustainability if we choose it. And I think there's a lot of great people like Greta Thunberg who are you know, making us people my age and older aware of, of the, the, the sanctity and sacredness of our planet and how we need to protect it and save it for ourselves. And that's really what world citizenship, what, what World Federation is about. And so really the, 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 we need to make that future now. We need to know that um, we need to be what I like to call real dealists, not just realists, not just idealists, but real dealists, right? It's, it's transcending that dico false dichotomy, you might say. And, and you know, because some people would say, look, you must be idealist, idealistic to think that we could continue with the current nation state system as it is and, and have a humanity you know, in 10 or 20 years or, or 50 years, right? We might kill each other. We might kill the planet if we don't stop what, the way we're governing uh, our world, both socially, politically, and economically. We, we, need, we need to change how we do things. It can't be about uh, the, you know, the, the holy you know, dollar or the, the growth or whatever. It has to be not growth economically, but growth intellectually and socially and, and growth in our hearts to, to uh, knowledge of, of loving the planet and loving each other. Um, so it really it's coming down to this bigger, this bigger picture, having a, a paradigm shift in our mind, in our mindset. We need to be that world citizen. We need to say, I, I don't just believe or I don't, I'm not for world citizenship, but I am a world citizen or I am a world federalist. And it's up to us to make it happen because if we don't do this, uh, who else is going to? It's up to us to make it happen, Omkar. Yeah, so, so for the future, I mean, you really the answer to uh, more more refined answer to your question, you know, where where do where do we go? Where are we going now? And I've already said right at the beginning of our conversation some of the things that we're doing now that we really want to ramp up uh, the process to make those happen, like the World Court of Human and Environmental Rights, like our World Citizen Clubs, like moving you know uh, to digital. Uh, documentation and ID, so we don't even have to waste any kind of paper or tree to produce this, right? Uh, um, so to think about, but also to think beyond the, the standard identity uh, that is foisted upon us. Um, Gary Davis uh, once said to me, David, um, there are two most important questions that exist in the world. I, so I said, well, Gary, what, what are those two most important questions? And he said, the first one is, who are you? The second one is, uh, how do we ensure the survival of humanity and the earth? And to the first one, who are you? If you can't answer, I'm a world citizen and my country is the world, then it's, all, it's possible that we're, we won't have a world because we, we won't have been smart enough to come together, to be real dealists, to, to, to know that we can have idealism and, as well as realism and make the kind of world that we want. Um, and if we don't figure out how to ensure the survival of humanity and the earth, well, then what else matters? Nothing else matters. So for both of those questions, we have to think holistically and think beyond the system that we've created for ourselves. It's not like, you know, yes, we maybe have inherited this from our parents and our grandparents, but just because we have inherited it doesn't make it good, doesn't make it right, doesn't make it the best. No. Yeah, we've been doing it for a long time and it maybe sort of works for some people, but there's, you know, billions of people who are almost starving to death if not, you know, just above, say, the poverty line. And, and how can we let our fellow humans, let alone the other creatures that we're, you know, trying to reside on the earth with, uh, live in the kind of agony and, and 
sadness and and day to day injustice that we're that we allow. How can we do that? Why are we doing that? These are questions that world federalists and world citizens must ask and must ask, must ask of the public to really bring that idea. And I, I pointed to my head and to my heart multiple times in this conversation because that's where where the sort of I would I guess I would say the absence of this knowledge uh, is, is, why, is why we're still running the world that we are, because in our minds, through our thought process and our knowledge and in our hearts, our, our feeling, our emotion, that's where we really need to grab people, both intellectually and emotionally, to these ideas. So you may have some suggestions of, of better how we, how we need to do that. I, I, I know that you do. Uh, let's just make it happen. Omkar, you and me, not just you and me, but everybody. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I also personally, I don't find the idea of a world government or a world federation utopian because what I find utopian is how are you going to solve climate change? How are you going to end nuclear proliferation without a world government? That exactly. is utopian in my opinion. Exactly. Yep. And You're talking exactly about right. this country also, like being an Indian, that actually strengthens my belief in world federation. Look at this country. Like, each of its states, 20, we have 28 states and around uh, eight union territories, if I'm right, because we had a lot of political reorganization in between. Each mm-hmm. of them has their own culture, their own language. There's no common religion. There's no common ethnicity. There's only one thing in common. That is the diversity amongst people and the patriotism towards the entity of India. So a lot of people were predicting, they were pessimistic that this country won't last. It won't last uh, two decades. But it has lasted. It's still going on. And people, they have like... Uh, they're very patriotic as Indians and they're safeguarding their own culture as well. So if India can succeed being a union of uh, states speaking different languages, different religions and all, why can't the world be a one, maybe like, why can't the world be a country? That's my argument for being a world federalist. Well, that that's dear to my heart and to my head. I, I, lo- I love that. Omkar, you said it beautifully. I mean, uh, it's India is the biggest democracy in the world, and I guess it's maybe the biggest federation in the world. So why why don't we just take that one step further and, and make it a, a world federation? It's so easy. We could we could really do it very quickly if if we put our our heads and our hearts, our minds and our uh, and our uh, hearts to that. Absolutely. Uh, this is a question that personally concerns me. Uh, I intend to pursue my higher studies in law and international relations. And I'm also considering public policy as well. Uh, I'm curious about the ways in which I can integrate the activism for world federalism into my profession. Are there any opportunities in this regard? Well, I know, for example, we have several different uh, internships for students, uh, usually in college or law school, um, not so much in high school, although we have had a few students who volunteered from high school, but this is why we have our World Citizen Clubs now. Uh, but so students c- some can come to our organization help. I know that the Young World Federalists on their Discord channel and in their uh, uh, organization is, bring, is bringing in youth uh, into the movement and to even have maybe a say on their board or to join their board. Uh, all World Federalist organizations are looking for youth to get involved. And so I certainly encourage you or your friends to consider reaching out to the World Federalist movement the, the, the world movement for that, or, you know, uh, to see, you know, wh- where, wh- where would the, where, what committee or what, what um, team could you be on? And, and once you get your f- first foot in, so to speak, meaning you, you've decided you would volunteer if you have the capacity, you know, if you don't have to have a job or something, if you can volunteer, and that's not everybody can do that. Some people have to work, you know, from when they're very young even. Um, but so, uh, but if you can, uh, if you can volunteer, that's the first step: is to get an internship or to volunteer on a team or a committee of, of an organization that's already working on this. Whether it's World Service Authority, whether it's Young World Federalist, World Federalist Movement, uh, or like here in the United States, Citizens for Global Solutions, or any of the myriad of other ones like the Earth uh, Constitution Movement. If you can get your foot in the door, then you know they're going to appreciate your activism for them just because you like the idea and they like you for what you're doing to help them and to promote that particular aspect of world federation and that's 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 the way to get in 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 my mind and i've talked to a lot of students 
uh, over the years about finding work, say, in international law or international relations. And, and that's certainly one of the big uh, suggestions, not, I would call it, not just mine, obviously, but, but that many people say is, is do that uh, volunteer time and work if you can. Also do what I would call informational, or not I, but what's called informational interviews. Um, uh, but so an informational interview is where you call up or Zoom with a leader in a, an organization, a nonprofit or an in, in non-governmental organization and say, oh, I, I don't want a job from you. I just want to hear what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course that makes somebody in a position of, of leadership you know, feel kind of good about themselves. Oh, I could be a mentor to this person. You know, it, it makes them feel good. So they might want to take some time, even if it's 20 minutes to talk to you about their organization. So that's another way to get the foot in the door, so to speak, to, to be able to, you know, have, have your image or your personality in front of someone who maybe someday you would get a job from uh, at, at some kind of, you know, NGO or UN organization. When I first started, uh, uh, my career right after law school, one of the first things I did was volunteer for the United Nations Association here in Washington, DC. And I was a secretary on their task force for UN restructuring. I was a secretary on their task force for cultures of peace. And I met a lot of amazing people who I've still stayed friends with and who I've found useful in, in my career and I've been useful to them in their career. So if you can find some places to volunteer uh, at, at nonprofits, non-governmental or intergovernmental organizations uh, in your in your local community, or even create, like I said, a, like a World Citizen Club in your community. That's going to uh, give you an you know uh, some somewhat of an advantage to get into this field that that others might not have if they don't take the time to do that. Thank you very much for the tip. You're welcome. Lastly, uh, what's the message to all those who are yet to know or be convinced about world federalism and world citizenship as a whole? Well, that's a really big uh, question and can be answered in, in different ways uh, of, of what's going to be the, the future for this movement and what can we do uh, to make a change in our world. And I would say, know that every individual, you as an individual, whoever's listening, you have power. You have power to make the kind of future that you want, not only for yourself, not only for your family, for your city, your community, uh, for your region, for the whole world, and at some point, maybe for the universe and the multiverse, if we ever do meet with extraterrestrials, right? Um, you have that kind of power right within you as a whole, even in your brain, it's, 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 it's as if it's its own universe. And know that you have that creativity, that power, you just have to claim it. You just have to, like I said, you have to know your rights. You have to know what they are so that you can claim them. Uh, you have to have, you have to be optimistic too. I think a lot of people, especially being stuck with the pandemic, you know, inside or not being able to meet with friends or family, it's put a damper on things. But I know Gary Davis, and maybe I'll end, end with this little story. Uh, Gary Davis uh, was an eternal optimist, even though he knew that in his lifetime there may not have be a fully functioning world government. He knew that he could take that first step. Like I said, there is no first step to world government. Creating it was the first step. And he said, now people just have to join. People just have to join up and say, yes, I declare my world citizenship too. And I'll be a part of that government too. And we'll, we'll make it happen together. Well, um, about four days before he, he di Gary died, uh, he was very ill. He was dying of cancer. And uh, at the very end of his life, he could not live in his home anymore. So they had to, uh, he had, you know, people helping him who were going to bring him to hospital. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay, sorry. I, was, I, thought, I thought it might be frozen. Um, anyway, so I was saying at the very end of his, his life, he was going to have to go into hospice because actually, uh, and he had a cane in each hand and he was walking down the stairs very slowly. And he did have excuse, me, help him, excuse me, David, uh, yep. I'm audible and visible to you. Yes, now you are. Okay, could you please just repeat what you said? 
Okay, how far back do you need me to go? Yeah, like just four days before Gary's death. Okay, right, okay, right. So four days before Gary's death, he was very ill. As I said, he was, they were going to have to bring him to hospice to die, in a sense, peacefully uh, without the pain. And uh, he, so he was leaving his home. He had a crutch in each hand to help him himself down his front stairs because there was an ambulance waiting for him uh, just you know, past his front yard uh, at his home, uh, which he called World Government House in, in Vermont. And so besides the two crutches in his hand that he was using to, to walk steadily, he had in one hand also, he was holding the crutch, and then he was holding a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in his hand. And as he made it to the ambulance slowly, he, he put down his cane, he handed the copy of the Declaration of Human Rights to the ambulance driver, and he asked the ambulance driver, do you know what this is? And the ambulance driver took a look at it, and he's like, no, I've never seen that before. What is that? Uh, which is sad that you know somebody can, can go their you know a lot of their adult life and not even have ever heard of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There's a problem with our educational system, but that could happen. But anyway, uh, Gary's like, well, this is one of the most important documents in the world. Please read it. Please learn it. Uh, this is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's it's all of, it's a lot of our rights. It's, it's maybe not all of them, but it's a lot of them. And please, if you can learn it, then you can know what your rights are, and then you can teach others. And this is literally, like I said, about four days before he was dying, he was such an optimist that, you know, he was still teaching, even though he was in pain, his body was, was giving out on him. He was still teaching people about their rights and their duties to each other and to humanity. So it's that kind of optimism, I guess, that I'm, you know, kind of concluding our conversation with that we all need to have. And it's not easy. I'm not saying that it's easy to have. And, and for some people, it's almost impossible to have when we have some basic needs or people have basic needs that they can't even fulfill, right? They're starving or they're hungry or whatever. They go to sleep hungry at night. So to have that kind of optimism is, is not easy, but we can create a world where there isn't that hunger, but we have to choose that world. And, and so for me, and, even, and for Gary, even though you know, he spent his entire adult life you know, 65 years and me now 30 years of my adult life as a world citizen, as a world federalist, it isn't always easy. There's a lot of, there is pushback. There is a uh, lack of understanding or comprehension of what we're trying to do. And, and that can be frustrating, but know that, that we know, I know that in our day-to-day -day work at World Service Authority, we are making change, not just on a global scale. Of course, we want a world, world change, a world mind change, but we are actually helping individuals at the same time, whether it's with our documentation, with our legal services, whatever it might be. I feel that the, the honor to and the responsibility to work in an organization that's changing the big picture, that's changing the, the paradigm, shifting the paradigm to one of uh, one world um, and world citizen and world federal government, but also helping people along the way. It's both. We have to do both. And we all can. And so my, I guess my final words to you, Umkar, is that we each have this power in us, in our heart and in our head. We just have to link those two together to make it happen. That was very inspiring. And uh, with that, I thank you for uh, your time and for patiently answering all my queries. And uh, I believe our viewers will like this interview a lot and, because they have been looking forward to this and uh, a lot of their personal questions must have been answered. So to all of those who are viewing this video, Please do consider commenting what, what you think about the idea. I, I'll attach the links to the World Services Authority. You can get the books, you can get the merchandise, you can maybe have a world passport issued for yourself over there. So do check them out and uh, do consider sharing this amongst your friends and acquaintances and spread the word. Well, Ankar, thank you so much for this opportunity. I've been looking forward to this too. So it's been a, a wonderful delight and pleasure for me to speak with you and your followers and audience and hopefully reach the, the wider world with this idea of, of loving each other and loving the planet. Thank you. Thank you.